Good morning, everybody. And happy Sabbath. Amen. It is. It's always happy Sabbath. Praise God for the Sabbath opportunity, time to come together, praise him in song, and praise him with his word uh, as we study together. For those that uh, don't know me, anybody that might be visiting today, yes, I'm Gavin, uh, my wife, Slata, up in the back corner, second from the back corner. Um, Slata and I have been married 31 years as of Thursday, which means we've been coming to this church for 31 years because, yeah, we have the, uh, the Serbian connection. But as you can tell by my accent, not so Serbian, huh? But that's all right. No more problema. No problem. Uh, so we, we always love it when we can come here and, and just to fellowship together. It's been a pleasure over all of these years. And whenever I have the opportunity to, to speak uh, from, from here, it's, it's, I just find it such a privilege to be able to speak on behalf of the, the God of the universe is not a small thing. And uh, we should never just take it like, oh, yeah, good. It's a chance to talk. And so... Um, you know, pastors, anybody that's ever presented a message, you know, oh, what will I talk about? What will I talk about? And I'll tell you, I've changed my mind five times this week on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And by Thursday evening, I'm like, i, I, I got to decide. So I've actually gone back to an old one because I'd started preparing three new ones during the week and such is life. The title, as you can see on the screen, and I'll be using a lot of screen. I do Bible work and uh, the method that I've become comfortable with is to present PowerPoints in people's homes. I, I put it up on their screen, on their television, and we just chat. We just talk about the things that are, that, that, yeah, are in the Word of God and, and uh, on their TV screens. And uh, so it's a little bit different when I do one in a, in a church setting uh, because there'll be obviously a lot less uh, communication in order to save time, because when you're in someone's home, you can just go on and on, and they're happy chatting, and, and so this, it can go a long time. But we'll try and stick to the, to the screen and, and to the message. Uh, Daniel's prophecies and the character of God. Um, and another title, or the original title, was actually uh, uh, the pro uh, Prophecies and the Mirror. Prophecies and the Mirror. And uh, the point being that the prophecies can tell us a lot about ourselves. Ever think about that? The prophecies can tell us a lot about ourselves. And so the prophecies are a mirror. Where do we fit in to the picture? Everyone loves a story, don't we? You know, from the time we're children and uh, mom or dad sitting us on their lap telling us stories about their life about their experiences, how it was back in the olden days. And wow, were those olden days a long time ago now. You know, when I was a kid, it was the olden days. Now mum and dad have passed and I'm, I'm older now and looking back at their stories thinking, wow, you know, great granddad had the first bus service in Brisbane at Mount Gravatt with the horse and carts. It's like, wow, horse and cart bus service, like, mm, interesting. And the stories go on. But we all love a story. And whether, no matter what culture it is, whether it's North American Indian, I've got a picture up there. Where, that doesn't matter where you're from. We love a story, whether it's history, um, wh whether it's something to do with education, learning. A lot of stories we, we learn at school from stories, from people's experiences, some fact, some fiction. But we love a story. And not only do we love a story, we love a winner. And of course, we love the stories that end up with, yay, the good guy won. You know, the hero wins and, and they live happily ever after. And, you know, when we were kids, it was always, you know, the, the, the guy on the white horse just sailed off with, with the, the woman that he won and, you know, goes off into the distance. But, yeah, victory goes to the brave. In society, we reward and give awards to people that demonstrate uh, that they were brave. And the little picture that's up there on the screen, anybody know who that is? Yeah, yeah, 
yeah, conscientious objector, Desmond uh, Doss, yeah. And, and so he was awarded for his bravery, and I'm not going to tell you his story. Um, most people know Desmond Doss's story by now. Um, but he won bravery in a war without ever holding a gun or shooting anybody, but he saved so many people's lives that he was, he was honoured with, with the highest honour that America can give. Um, yeah, we also award people or reward people just because they're good at something. Isn't that interesting? Just because they're good at something. We give them a gold medal if they're best, a silver one if they were pretty good, and a bronze if they're not so good, and everybody else, it was like, thanks for coming, you made the race or whatever it was. Really fun, but we don't give them anything. And so most people in life go through without actually being the victor, the winner. And, and, and that's what life's about, whether it's at school, education, you know, get the best marks and you'll be uh, rewarded or paid out with probably the best jobs, the most money. Today we'll discover not only who wins, but what wins in the battle of life. Okay? And remembering this is about prophecy, this, so this is a big picture that we're going to be looking at today. I like big pictures, that's, that's how my brain tends to work. And um, so not only who wins... Because as Christians, we know who wins, don't we? Jesus wins. Yay. He's already won. And we will win with him if we stay with him. But what wins in the battle of life? What is it that actually gives us the victory? And again, it's broad spectrum. God said to Isaiah in, in chapter 55 of the book um, of Isaiah and verse 8, he says, My thoughts are not your thoughts. And neither are my ways your ways. That has always intrigued me. That God says, I don't think like you do. I don't think like you do. Therefore, what I do, my ways, are not like your ways. And so, in the context of everyone loves a winner, okay, we give to the best. We give the reward to the best. And God says, well, my thoughts are not like yours. My ways are not like yours. How does he hand out his rewards? What's his rewards based on if it's not being the best? So that's an interesting question. Here's another one in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. Then he answered and spoke to me, saying, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Hmm. At the moment, I understand the Commonwealth Games have started. And there's going to be guys that are going to be standing up and they're going to be going... Not, not, it's not by God's kingdom that the eventual victory will be won, but by his spirit. And we might remember the verse that says, I wasn't in the earthquake. I wasn't in, what was, I can't remember them all now, the fire, I wasn't in the storm, etc. But by a still small voice. It was the still small voice um, that God sp speaks and it's by his spirit that God's victory is won. And we've got to apply that. We're going to apply that to prophecy. Because again, prophecy, as a young fella, as a 17-year-old, and as you know, I mentioned so many times, I wanted to be a professional golfer, and I wasn't too bad at it. I wasn't bad at golf. Until I learned about Jesus, and I learned about eternity, and I learned about just how good God is. And it's like golf... Fun, yeah, but not that important. And when I came into the church, it was, it was um, one of the things that, of course, we do as Adventists, as Seventh-day Adventists. We look at prophecy, don't we? And we show how God knows the end from the beginning and before things happen. He already has predicted it. He knows what's going to go on. And, like, that's really impressive. And, uh, but I want to look deeper than just 
the historical facts, the dates, the names, the places that God predicted centuries before they took place. Okay, that convinced me, yes, there is a God, that, that he could do that. And that is impressive. But as we move on in our Christian experience, and, and especially for me, you know, just lately I've been look, like, and, and Tim mentioned this morning reading the story of Hosea, it's just like all of a sudden you realize, oh, that story's about me. And that's what we should be doing when we're reading the scriptures, is looking at the stories and where am I in that story? And this morning, I want to look at it and for us to reflect, where am I in the prophecies of Daniel in a deeper, meaningful way? Paul wrote in Corinthians or to the Corinthians, now all these ha things happen to them for examples. And they are written for our admonition, for our benefit, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Hey, anyone's looked around the world lately? according to what we know in the scriptures, and it's like, mm, it's, it's getting close, isn't it? Isn't it? Do we believe it? Whew. I've watched a lot of stuff, and oh, no, I'll get distracted. I, 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 I've looked at a lot of stuff in the 40 years I've been a Christian. And I've looked and go, oh, yeah, you know, okay, that will, that'll happen, that will happen. But now, this week, I was looking at some things, and I'm just like, Lord, th this, this is tragic, we, 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 this is tragic, and I don't want to get off on a, on a detour, which I easily can. But I'll just give you one example of something I, I, I saw this week in the news, and it's not on the mainstream news. You've got, to, you've got to search for this stuff. Monterey, Mexico, did anybody read about that? Anybody see about that? Anybody know what's going on around the world? A month without water in a major city? While... Cover this up. While Coca-Cola is just pulling millions of dollars out, they've got a, a facility, millions of dollars, millions of litres pumping out of the ground so that they can produce drinks. While the people, and they showed the, they showed the people with buckets going and getting dirty brown water from the back of a truck. That's what's going on in parts of our world. And I thought, Lord, how long can this go on? And we know it's going to get worse if you've been following the track. It's going to get worse. And, I, and I'll stop going on about that stuff because I want to focus on prophecy in us. But, yes, upon whom the ends of the world are come. The point is the, the stories of the Bible are to prepare us to stand in the last days. It sounds pretty frightening in a sense. You think, oh, last days, end of the world? Like, yuck. Who wants to go through that sort of stuff? But it's going to happen. The Bible's made it really clear. The signposts are there telling us what would go on, and we're there. I believe we're there. How, how long? I'm not sure. I'm not time-setting. But that makes the stories of the Bible so pertinent to us, so important to us, so that we can learn from the lessons of the people that have gone before us so that we can know how to stand, how to get the victory. And that's what this is about. What in the world is, yeah, what in the world does ancient history have to do with me today? A lot. I hated history at school. I was a sports nut. I hated history, wasn't interested in it. But when I become a Christian, wow, did that change? Because I learned that history has an extremely, um, it's very, had a big influence in my life in more ways than one. Because history is just not about nations rising, nations falling. This politician comes in, this one goes out. It's, 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 there's a spiritual element to it that most people don't even realize. Another topic, another subject, religion and politics. But there are lessons, multiple lessons for us to learn from the prophecies. Prophecy and theology. Okay, what is prophecy? Definition, a prediction about what will happen in the future. And people make money from that have throughout the years, haven't they? They sit on their little corner. I remember when we were in China, this old man with the long beard sitting on a box with people coming to him, giving him money, and he would be reading one thing or another. You know, flipping cards, doing this, doing that, and making money out of predicting the future. Their, and their accuracy is really poor. Same happens in the West. We have our own prophets. Bible prophecy, 100% accurate, isn't it? 
It's, it's, it's been sitting there for two and a half thousand years and people at any stage can come up and go, well, this was garbage. This missed the mark. This was wrong. And the, bo the book still sits here unchanged and it's like nobody's proved it wrong. Why? Because there is a God and he's always right. He's not guessing. He knows. So prophecy is a prediction of what will happen in the future. Theology is a study of the nature of God. Who is God and what he is like? And the religious belief that is attached to that. But I'd also like to add another aspect. Is parable. Okay. We've heard of parables before. A parable is a story. Jesus used lots of stories, didn't he? Lots of parables told with the intent of portraying a moral or spiritual lesson. Christ's object lessons were always about things that were practical, things that people could relate to uh, in their life. And if Jesus was to, around today, it'd be interesting to know what kind of parables he would use in our modern technological world. Because he used to say, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. What? The kingdom of God is like a man who found a treasure in the field. Yeah. And, and he'd tell all these interesting stories about what the kingdom of God is like, but to bring out a moral and a spiritual teaching. That's just how Jesus did it. Today I would like to su suggest the possibility that prophecies are in fact parables of events yet future designed to teach moral and spiritual lessons. I'll repeat that. The prophecies are in fact parables of events yet future, when they were written, designed to teach moral and spiritual lessons. And we can learn from those lessons. Christ Object Lessons, page 17. In Christ's parable teaching, the same principle is seen as in his own mission to the world. So when Jesus, we know Jesus came with a special mission, a special mission to accomplish, a certain thing to reveal to the world. And the parables were in harmony with that. They were to teach about that exact mission. That we might become acquainted with his divine character and life, Christ took on our nature and dwelt among us. So is it possible that a lot of those parables and his very mission was to teach about his divine character in his life? Yes, I believe that's true. Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. In the man, Jesus Christ, we could see the attributes of the divine, invisible God that created this world. Like, wow. So that's why he came? It's one of the primary reasons he came, to show us what God was like. Men could learn of the unknown, God, through the known, Jesus. Heavenly things were revealed through the earthly. God was made manifest in the likeness of men. And we know in Romans 1, 20, about 20, you know, the invisible things of God are, um, are clearly seen, being known by the things which he has made, even his eternal Godhead or divinity. So we can learn a lot about God through parables, through Jesus' life himself, and I'm suggesting again today, through prophecy. So it was in Christ's teaching, the unknown was illustrated by the known, divine truths by earthly things with which people were most familiar. And that's a good way when you're teaching somebody, is to learn about who they are and what interests they have, and then model your teaching to meet that individual per person. And that's why I like the... the um, the PowerPoint idea is so when I go, and, and I usually have lots of questions on the screen as well, but yeah, I go into their home, I ask questions, get them to feed back what they think about different topics, what, what their understanding is, and, and then you're learning on the run about them, and uh, yeah, and you can model your lesson to the person as you're going. It just helps me 
of the PowerPoints. So yeah, the things that were most familiar. The law of God, here's a statement, the law of God. Remember the Ten Commandments? Those ten laws are a transcript of God's character. In each one of the Ten Commandments, we see something about God, who he is, what he is like. So the question I ask is, what has the law of God got to do with prophecy? As Adventist, Seventh-day Adventist Christians, as soon as we think of the law of God and prophecy, which commandment do we think of? <laughs> the fourth one, don't we? We, 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 ah, the Sabbath, the Sabbath is the issue. It's all about the Sabbath. And, and, and Sabbath is very central, extremely central. But the first one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. I mean, that's pretty prophetic. That, that's going to have a big bearing in prophecy, don't you think? People worshipping different gods, don't have any idols, don't make them, don't bow down to them. The world's going to have all sorts of different ideas about God and bow to those ideas. Some people even worship nature itself. Um, don't take his name in vain. Wow, we read in Revelation 13, don't we? About powers that will control the world in the name of God in vain. Taking his name in vain and doing some really, really nasty things. That's in prophecy. So you can see, and then there's the Sabbath, honour your mother and father, and, and I, I could go on. Thou should not kill. Do you think that has a prophetic application? You better believe it does, and we'll, we'll see that as we go on. Both it did in the past, fulfilling of prophecy, and in the future at the end. Because thou should not kill is God's character. And those that take God's name in vain and don't know him, in the name of God, have and will go about breaking that law. Huh? Wow. Christians killing in the name of God. Who would ever have imagined? But history's full of it. Christians, angry Christians, defending the faith by killing others that don't agree with them. Watch this space. Watch the world around us. At the moment it's all political. You wait till it goes religious and see what happens. Mark those words. What we believe or don't believe about God or gods will determine what we are like and how we will live. Depending on what we think God is like gives us license to live in a certain way because if we're in harmony with God, it's like, hey, it must be good. It must be okay. Watch how this unfolds. Some examples. How could these different beliefs about God impact the way people relate to others? Okay, I've just, got, I've just got three examples here. First one, I believe is a God of strict judgment and I'm here to represent him. Mm. I believe that God is a God of vengeance. And I'm here to represent him. I believe God demonstrates his power by destroying his enemies at the end. And I'm here to represent him. If we believe the first one, it will be very easy to become judgmental. God's a God of strict judgment. Very easy to become judgmental if that's what your God is like. Because you just, as you behold, you become changed. Is that not biblical? Corinthians tells us that. We behold God's glory, we'll be changed from that image, from glory to glory into the same image by the Spirit of the Lord, Paul said. If we see God as this God of strict judgment, we will become judgmental. If we believe God's a God's of of God is a God of vengeance, then we can and will become resentful, bitter, and violent. Ouch. This, this is Christians, because they believe in God. And if I believe that God demonstrates his power by destroying his enemies, what will I become? Oh, I thought I changed that. Yeah, judge, judgmental. Um, 
This morning I changed that. I must have forgot to click the save button. There was another word I come up with because I didn't want to repeat the judgmental. Mm. Anyway, you get the point. Has there been throughout history, and it was predicted in advance, we know the, stu the, the, the studies of Daniel, has there been a Christian organisation that controlled the world for over a thousand years that believed in a God of strict judgment? And how did it treat people? Terribly. Terribly. Did they believe that God was a God of vengeance? And what did they do to people all around the world? Did they believe that God destroys his enemies? Mm. Did they do the same? Hmm. Okay. We don't want to fall into that trap. Wouldn't it be interesting if the way people think and act and relate to others based on their beliefs about God, the God, whoever it is that they worship, actually in a remarkable, and I, and I put a small g because it's God general, not the true God. Based on their beliefs about God or their gods, actually in a remarkable way led to the fulfillment of the prophecies of God that the God of heaven foresaw and has recorded in the Bible. Wouldn't that be interesting? If what you understood, if what they understood about their God influenced the way that they treated others and the way they treated others fulfilled the prophecies that God had predicted. Isn't that interesting? Interesting point. Theology, their understanding of God, determines prophetic fulfillment. Fascinating thought. And it will be in the future. Revelation 13. The theology of those entities, those organizations, those people, will determine how they fulfill the prophecies in persecution, etc., etc. We've seen it in days of old. There you go, Daniel 2. The big image. We're not going to do the, you know, the prophecy today, as it were. Um, about that image, but that image of the multi different metals represented district, dif uh, different time periods in Earth's history. And as you can see, it begins in 605 in Babylon and goes right through to the second coming, which is just around the corner, however many years. So we have two and a half thousand years of prophecy wrapped up in an image of several different metals. But again, it's not a history lesson today. You can, you can come to church and you can study with the pastors, with, with other Adventists. We all know these prophecies. My point today is the moral and spiritual lessons from the prophecies. You know, how did Babylon come into being? How did it fall? How did Medio Persia come into being? How did it fall? These are the things we all look at. Jesus said, Judge not, lest you be judged. For with what judgment you judge, you shall be judged. And with what measure you meet, deal it out, it will be dealt back to you again. So the way you treat others will come back to you. This, this is what we call design law. It's a law within God's design, within his creation. You know, some call it karma. In different religions, they call it karma. But it's just a principle of law. When you do something, it will come back upon you. Was it the first law of thermodynamics? To every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. However much force you push, that's how much force will come back. Okay, spiritually, judgmentally, etc. It's exactly the same principle. As we judge, that's how it'll come back on us. Therefore, all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Hmm, interesting. The law and the prophets. 
depending on how nations interacted with other nations, depending on how individuals acted with other individuals, the circumstances of their lives would be impacted. If they were positive, be a positive interaction. If it was negative, negative interaction. Think about what's going on around our world today. It's just all positivity coming out of the news, isn't it? You know, you go to Google, you go to BitChute, you go to all these other things. It's just positive messages, isn't it? Tongue in cheek, sarcasm, sorry. It's rotten stuff out there. So what will be the outcome for those people? There's going to be a rotten outcome. And that is why it's so important to keep the mind focused, not on the negative, but on the positive. The principle of Jesus' kingdom. Paul talked about this, or he wrote about this in Philippians. Chapter 4 and verse 8. Finally, brethren... Whatever things are true, whatever things are honest, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. The obvious question, why? Why should we think about all that positive stuff is it is it just simply a matter of positive you know the power of positive thinking oh let's write a book the power of positive thinking yes positive thinking has a powerful influence on your life your body your health and all these things but we're talking about fulfilling of prophecy today and so how does all these positive things affect us think Think on these things. Think on all these beautiful things. Why? Because, did you know, you are what you think, and what you think, you are. You are what you think, and what you think, you are. So if you're always thinking negative things, if you're always searching for the negative things, if you're looking for what's going on in the world, all the bad things, what can you only report on? All that stuff. But if you're looking at the true and the honest and the just and the pure, where where do we find all that stuff? In the Bible. In Jesus. I would love to think in one another as we practice the principles of God's kingdom. We should think upon those things because what we think is what we are. And for those of us that have a, a history of negative thinking because I'm no different to anyone else, for those of us that have a history of negative thinking, we can refocus. We can change the channel. We can change what we're looking at on the screen and focus on God, focus on his kingdom, and we can be changed into that image. Imagine being true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. Wouldn't that make us lovely husbands and wives and children to live with? Hey? Interesting point. Okay. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Exactly. We're not going to talk about things we don't understand or who we are. We talk about that which we love. We talk about things in the context of our own character and nature. That's just what we talk about. So when you hang out with people long enough, you'll start to know where their interests are and, yeah, what their interests are. Even Christians hang around some Christians long enough and you go, wow, they just love talking about Jesus. Hang around around other Christians and you think, wow, they don't talk about Jesus too much. Because out of the heart, the mouth speaks. And we want Jesus in our heart, don't we? Because he's the only answer. Keep your heart with all diligence. Protect what goes into your heart and mind. That's what he's saying. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. We live what we are. We live what we understand. We live what we know. For as he thinks in his heart, so is he. The Bible's really clear on that. That's the why. Because you are what you think. And what you think, you are. Okay. And Jesus magnified this, expounded on this in, in Matthew 5. 
And uh, I've recently just done a series on, on Matthew 5 here. Um, yeah, each one of these is just a brilliant study. For example, Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Okay? The poor in spirit is the state of the heart. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the destiny. Can you see that now? How your heart is will determine your destiny. Blessed are they that mourn. You know, there's a lot of sorrow in life. Okay, blessed are they that mourn. The idea being when you mourn, you turn to God. And when you're in that state, you shall be comforted as your heart, so your destiny. Blessed are the meek, the state of the heart, they shall inherit the earth, the destiny. Okay, I won't go through all of them. But Jesus certainly expounded the principles of that for us. What's people's response? This is very interesting, Matthew 5, like 10 to 12, because it's what Jesus was going to go through. Because wasn't he pure and honest and lovely and just and, you know, etc., etc.? He was. How do people react to Jesus? Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, of course, Jesus is the prince of peace. Yes. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Okay? People don't like good people anymore. It's really interesting. You say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, we do like good people. Um, most people like people that agree with them. Okay? They'll call you a good guy. Like, he was a great bloke because he agreed and loved the same things. But if your goodness is in harmony with Jesus' goodness, if your goodness is in harmony with the principles of the Bible, you see how many friends you have in, in, in society. Okay? That's why we don't have 10,000 in here and just a few guys at the footy. Okay? We have a few guys here and tens of thousands at the footy because they're all good guys and they love each other and because they support the same team. Yeah, blessed are them, yeah. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Destiny. When people don't understand your heart, when they persecute you because they don't understand you, if you're in harmony with God, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. Hallelujah. Great is your reward on earth? No. No. There are blessings attached to following God and his kingdom in this world. But our great reward will be when this is all over and we're in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. And that wasn't just the other nations persecuting the prophets, was it? No, it was God's own people persecuting the prophets. And again, oh, would we do that? Would we persecute God's own people that come with a message because we didn't agree with it? It's like, whoa. Daniel's prophecies in a mirror. We put ourselves in the picture and we see, Gav, how do I judge other people with different ideas, with different opinions? How did Jesus do that? We want to be like Jesus. The principles of Christ's kingdom. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants, what would they do? Fight. He was speaking to Pilate, wasn't he? He was just about to be crucified. And he says, my kingdom's not of this world. Wouldn't that scare you? Because Pilate's used to dealing with people that want to just go up the tree, you know, go up the hierarchical tree and be the next governor, be the next king, be the next leader, nation conquering another nation, whatever. And here's a guy with thousands of people following him over the last few years. And he says, do you know I have the power to kill you? And, I have and Jesus goes... <laughs> you don't have no power except it was given by my father. And then he says, my kingdom's not of this world. And all of a sudden, Pilate's like, who is this guy? He doesn't think like normal people. He's not scared of my authority. Wow. Jesus was amazing. Yeah, my servants would fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from here? 
brothers and sisters, I stand before you today as, as a, a fellow servant in the kingdom of Jesus. Um, I don't want to fight. I don't want to fight people. I'll sit down and talk. I'll sit down and share. That's how Christians should do things. We'll compare things with one another. But fight, get angry, get bitter, get judgmental, that is not the spirit of God. Amen? Amen. But that's the spirit that's coming into this world, even coming into Christianity. God help us. Jesus told the story here of, um, and it's a parable, okay, of the certain householder. And he goes out, he sets, up, he sets up his fields, the vines, everything, everything's set up and he gives it to servants. Okay, you guys look after this. You guys look after the field. And after a while, he sends some servants along to um, check out how things are going. And they beat him. They bash these guys. Go away, they said. Get lost. So later on, they, sent, and they even killed some. And others, he sent more. Later on, he sent more. And they did the same thing, killing the prophets. Finally, got the, the, the story goes that the, the husbandman says, I'm going to send my son. They'll reverence my boy. They'll know he's mine. And so the son goes down and what did they do? They killed him too. They said, if we get rid of the son, we inherit the whole thing. <coughs> wow, Jesus was telling a story to the children of Israel, of what they'd done to the prophets through history and what they were about to do to him himself. And they missed it. And then when he turned it back to them, he said, and, and, and what should the good man of the house do to these people? And these guys pronounced their own judgment based on their own thinking for what they thought they were. And he said, oh, you'll trip. What, what does it say? Um... He will miserably destroy, verse 41, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and let out his vineyard to others who will render to him his fruits in his seasons. Isn't that what happened to Israel? The judgments came upon them. That's another history lesson. Not going to go into that today. Forty years after Jesus was crucified, Jerusalem fell, destroyed by the Romans. Whoa. And Jesus put all this into one Little story. As you judge, so you'll be judged. And this was a prophecy in parable form. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. It's a simple law, uh, simple law of cause and effect. As you are, so it will come back. As you forgive others, God can forgive you. Not that he's changed his mind and go, oh, okay, now I'll forgive you because you're forgiving. God can't forgive you if you're unforgiving because your spirit of unforgiveness, magnified in an amazing way, says to God, no, you can't forgive me either. And we don't even think about that. We, 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 we might pray, Lord, forgive me, like that guy that Jesus told the other story, didn't he? The guy that was owed, the, the guy that owed somebody heaps of money and he was forgiven. He's like, oh, thank you so much. And as he walked down the street thinking, oh, I've been forgiven, he, he found somebody that owed him like five bucks or whatever it was. And he goes, oh, you owed me five bucks. And, and the other fellow heard about it. He said, come back here. Come back here. I was so willing. I wanted to forgive you. But look what you're like. I, I, I can't offer forgiveness if you can't. Because we have to represent God. We have to represent God in forgiveness as well, even for those that trespass against us. Given it shall be given to you, good, uh, good, it shall be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men, men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet it, it shall be measured to you. Interesting language, the King James, the old English. Um, do nice things to others and they'll do nice things back to you. Be friendly to others and they will be friendly to you. Treat others like dirt and don't be surprised if that's how you'll be treated. People... People are so willing to accept you if you accept them. All right? Doesn't, have, doesn't mean you have to believe everything they believe. Doesn't mean you have to go where they go. But accept them as a fellow human being with the respect and dignity that they 
deserve being a child of God. Many of them don't even know they're children of God. They've been hoodwinked by education, maybe grew up in the wrong family, whatever. But we can show them something different. Nah, love you, man. Because you're a child of God, you're a brother. Not just because we're flesh and blood, but because God has united us all together in one. So the principle here in um, Daniel 2 is that they conquered for their gods. You know, if the, the Babylonians go out and win the war and everything, has got like, our gods are best. Your gods are pathetic because our gods gave us the victory and, and so now we're number one. And a few years go by and while they're drinking, eating, drinking and being merry, Darius goes up. Um, the Euphrates River, doesn't he? When they divert the water, he goes up, the, um, the army goes up the river, goes underneath the gates of Babylon, and <laughs> Babylon falls. It's like, hey, the Medo-Persian gods are actually the best gods. Hey, not the Babylonian ones. We're better than they are. <laughs> and um, how long did Medo-Persia last? A couple hundred years. And Greece come along, Alexander the Great. <laughs> he comes in with speed like nothing they'd seen before. Okay, conquers the Medo-Persians. Rome comes along, tramples on them, bang, bang. Okay, not just a history lesson, there's principles here. How did each nation win their particular victory? Very violently, very aggressively, until Jesus came along. Jesus comes along, and there on the right-hand side of the screen, there's just a picture of some crosses Jesus gained the ultimate victory. And he did it passively. And this is the thing that fascinates me about God's kingdom. My thoughts are not your thoughts, therefore my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. Why? Because nailed to the cross, people were laughing at him. They were mocking him. Ah, if you're the son of God, you get down. You know, you can't even save yourself. Or you saved others, you can't even save yourself. If you can't save yourself, you really can't save others, fella. And Jesus just says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. They don't know what they're doing. They don't know that they're killing the son that was sent to give them life. He did it passively. We'll get back to that principle soon. In Daniel chapter 7, we, we have like, like another layer of the prophecies. Daniel 2 told us about the kingdoms. Daniel 7 tells us about the same kingdoms but gives us some um, different pictures, different symbols. Lion, king of the jungle. Okay, that's Babylon with wings. Babylon went, it flew quickly and conquered vast areas. The meter Persia, the bear, comes along, it's aggressive. Ribs in its teeth, as described in that prophecy. And again, demonstrating, showing violence. The lion, violent. Babylon, violent. Medo Persia, the bear, violent. And then the leopard with four heads and four wings. Alexander the Great, and then his four generals. Whew, how far they went. Wasn't it from India right across to Egypt? Conquered everything by the age of 32 was so bored with life, drunk himself to death, died drunk. Wow, what a sad story. And then, of course, the undescribable or indescribable beast with the ten horns and crazy teeth and stomping on everybody. Violence just getting more and more and more. And again, yeah, um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Principles. Conquer or, or, or be conquered. Is, isn't that the motto of this world? You know, hit them hard, hit them fast, hit them constantly, win the war. Apply that to football. Apply that to whatever sport. Hit them hard, hit them fast, hit them constantly, just, and you will win. Conquer or be conquered. You don't want to be a loser. Huh? Anybody here like being a loser? No, you don't have to answer that. No one wants to be a loser. Huh. But the principle we've been learning today, conquer and be conquered. Guaranteed, 100%. If you conquer through violence, guarantee 
You'll be conquered by violence. Conquest by violence guarantees what? Like I just said. It guarantees you will be conquered by violence. Conquering quickly guarantees what? You will be conquered quickly. And, 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 and the point, because some of those kingdoms lasted for like hundreds of years and thousand years plus, but each individual leader, each king, each Caesar, each governor, only lived a short period of time, was conquered. And some of the stories about some of those guys killing their brothers because they were worried that somebody else is going to take my throne. You know, et tu bre- a brute, you know, <laughs> they killed Caesar. You know, like, wow, you too, Brutus? Violence, violence, violence. Conquering without violence guarantees what? Anybody ha- want, want to try and answer that one? Conquering without violence guarantees what? Conquering without violence guarantees you will never be conquered again. And it's like, oh, what are you saying, Gavin? And it can be confusing, so I'll, I'll pull this together. Conquering without violence means... Uh, no, I'm going to hold it because my thought's coming up. All of those nations conquered by violence, all of those nations have passed, but... The one who died on the cross is coming again. Amen? Amen. The one who submitted to the authorities because he wasn't scared of them, who said, my kingdom is not of this world, has promised to come again and it's not far away. When he comes back, how will he conquer? And you hold that thought in your own mind. You decide how he will conquer when he returns. Because he is called King of Kings, Lord of Lords, Prince of Peace. Now, the Prince of Peace, the principles of his kingdom, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, etc. What can conquer such a kingdom? What can conquer a kingdom of love, joy, or peace? What can overthrow it and replace it? Nothing. Because it's the law of the universe. It's the law which God established before anything was ever made. The law of love will endure forever. And all those that follow the principles of Satan's kingdom, war, violence, vengeance, sadly they'll pass away because as they judged, so they will be judged, their own condemnation. I love that picture of Jesus talking to the people on the, on the hill. What does it mean to be conquered without violence, force or threat? This is just my thoughts. You can have your own. What does it mean to be conquered without violence, force or threat? It means your heart has been won. Your heart has been won. Has your heart been won? Has God conquered you without any violence? Are you willing to submit to that kingdom with the hope, the assurance that you will live forever in that kingdom? I certainly hope so. This is my desire for me and for you and for all of those around us that they would better understand God and the principles of his kingdom. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So, wrapping it up, Daniel's prophecies and the character of God. The mirror. Which, which, which role do we play in the prophecies? Which role shall we play in the prophecies? Which character will we reflect in these last days? All violence is self-destructive and will be conquered by violence. That's what prophecy teaches us. Theology, only the Prince of Peace can conquer the heart without destroying it. Hallelujah for a conquered heart that's conquered by peace. And finally, the parable. 
History teaches us the moral and spiritual nature of war. The winner in the great controversy will be the kingdom of peace, which can never be conquered. It will never be conquered. And that's why I became a Christian, and that's why I'm staying a Christian. I can't guarantee every day is going to be a bed of rose petals and it's going to be wonderful. No, 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 no. Because there's an enemy in this world that wants to make God and his kingdom look pathetic. But not anymore. Not when you know what God's like. No. There's no weakness in humility and meekness. No weakness. It's the strength and it's the guarantee. That's why Jesus was raised on the third day. To show that that humility is rewarded with life. And if we follow that kingdom, we will be rewarded with eternal life. May God bless everybody.